the Orca site. Uh, many of you are Orca parents, but many of you are not, and we thank you for coming here. I'm not going to say very much at all because you're not here to listen to me, but I will just say that Mr. Temple is uh, much better at introducing himself than I am. He came over for our teachers' educational conference, and every teacher in the school had a talk, and though it made a dramatic difference to the teachers. We are extremely grateful that the PTA have helped us to bring Ben mm -hmm. back to speak with the students and also with the parents. Ben has been working with uh, Class 9 students today and will be working with Class 9 tomorrow and then at the heart later in the week. Um, so Ben, we thank you very much for being here and we thank you for coming to hear Ben Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, last time I was in Rio, it took me three and a half hours to get from the hotel to the airport. Wow. So uh, you guys have clearly battled some serious traffic to get here, and I, I thank you for that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do uh, this evening. Um, a lot of, this is much more based tonight in the work I do with students than the work that I do with staff. So we're not really looking tonight at teaching and some of the principles of uh, the leader, the teacher as a leader, when, and, and about the personal responsibility and commitment of teachers, we're not really looking at that. We're going to lo look much more at students. So just to, be, uh, just to give you some background to this, for those of you who uh, don't know much about my company or what I do, which would be quite understandable, um, my background was as an actor. I was a lead actor at the Globe Theatre in London, along with a guy called Mark Rylance. Uh, who's now become very famous because he's doing lots of movies with Steven Spielberg. But um, uh, 20 years ago, he ran the globe. And he and I had a director called Richard Olivier, who is the son of the once world-famous English actor, Laurence Olivier. The three of us uh, started an idea to use Shakespeare plays to look at major themes in people's lives beyond theatre, so that you didn't have to go to the theatre for it. You could come to a workshop and you'd look at, well, where has this play got something to do with my life way beyond the theatre? And we centered the, the beginning of it around Shakespeare's play of Henry V and around inspirational leadership. And this little idea became very successful in its own small way. And we started working, well, we were talking about this a few months ago, we started working with organizations all over the world looking at aspects of inspirational leadership through the lens of Shakespeare. And people would come and go, oh God, this is going to be awful, I'm going to have to do acting, I hate this kind of thing, and they never had to do acting. It wasn't about acting, it was about leadership. And um, so the whole thing snowballed, and myself and Richard eventually gave up the theatre to do this work full time, and to work with um, business leaders and community leaders all over the world. And it took on a momentum of its own. We started getting asked to go to Washington, D.C., and Hong Kong, and all kinds of different places um, in order to uh, develop this work. We developed lots of different plays, and I did that for about five years. And then I realized there was one group that interested me far more than all the others, and they were your children. And indeed, my children, because at that point, my children were just being born. And it woke me up to something very important to me, which is actually I want to work in education. So I decided to start a separate company that works only in schools. And we work with staff, we work with mental staff, and we do a lot of mental students. And that is really the background to this, because once I started going into the schools regularly, it was a while since I'd been at school myself, something started becoming very clear to me, which is really what this talk is partly about, which is that, um, what was required for inspirational leadership in many government and business organizations was very, very different from what government set as curriculum for students. They are not necessarily the same thing at all. Being fantastically good at maths is amazing, it's important, it's brilliant. But it's not necessarily what a lot of business leadership is about, or indeed government leadership or in the inspirational communication in many different areas of life. And a lot of the stuff that I found some very inspiring men and women possessed was not really in the curriculum at all. Teachers gave it to the students, good teachers were doing it with students, and there were many areas where they'd learn it, it, it like on the side of the curriculum. But the main curriculum couldn't really tell you whether a student was a potential inspirational leader or not. 
So I wanted to look at that theme far more. Now in my country, in the UK, education has become spectacularly based on examination testing. You would almost think, looking at the UK curriculum, that an entire, a child's entire identity is based really on their examination scores. And uh, I would say that is grossly inaccurate and a really unhelpful measurement tool. It's great for kids who are good at sit up written exams. They tend to do really well by that system. And then there are others who find it massively difficult. And there are some of those others who find it massively difficult, who once they, once they get out into what is weirdly sometimes called the real world, as if schools are not part of the real world, they, they would suddenly develop and flourish and do really well and make contacts and be really good with people and make friends well and be really good at selling a vision of why they did what they did and begin a small business and start making loads of money. And then some of their teachers would go, well, we never thought you'd amount to anything. And it's like, well, because we were, we were playing the wrong kind of game. You know, if you ask Lionel Messi to, you know, design a computer for you, he's not necessarily going to do it particularly well, because that's not what Lionel Messi is particularly good at. But you put him on a football field, and suddenly he's a genius. And I, one of the things that I felt, and I have to say that I found that schools have been incredibly supportive, is that what government thinks, not so much educators, teachers, that they know a great deal more about it, in my opinion. What government thinks is education, and what is perhaps a true education are not necessarily the same thing at all. And indeed, one of the um, four elements that we're going to look at tonight massively struggles with that idea. And we'll come to that a bit later on. The other three develop it in a different way. So the model you're going to, we're going to work with tonight is, uh, is not for the lovers of the latest psychometric testing. This is an idea which was started in ancient Greece. The first reference to it is by a philosopher called Empedocles, but it was also an idea that was very popular with people like Aristotle. And it was very popular at the time of the World Theatre and in the Elizabethan society, or amongst the Elizabethan kind of intelligentsia. And if you ever go to the Globe Theatre in London, you will see that it's actually encoded into the stage. The actual stage represents this idea. So the Elizabethans, getting the idea from the ancient had a, 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 an idea that the, the human life was divided into four great elements. Now, we now know this is not true. You know, you don't, you don't have to go into a chemistry lesson to see that there are over 100 elements on a periodic table, and none of them are what I'm going to describe here. This is a different way of looking at elements, and indeed, indigenous cultures around the world had quite a similar idea. And the four elements were called uh, certainly in Elizabethan England, for humans, they were sometimes called as well. Earth, water, air, and fire. Now you might go, well, so what? I mean, what does this mean? Other than a bunch of sort of, you know, massively outdated mysticism, what does that mean? Well, this is effectively what they mean. The PowerPoint tonight is very basic. This is not a PowerPoint-heavy tool. The, four, uh, the Earth represents the physical, your body, the thing you live in, feeling speak through. This does not score so high in the current list of priorities in Western education. Above it is the water element, emotions and feeling states. And we did a lot this morning on emotions and feeling states with the students and, and talking to them as a group. And I was saying to them, um, do, you know, do you ever come into school in a bad mood and you don't really know why? And but the whole group went, yeah, absolutely, that happens. And I said, if someone says to you, cheer up, does it help? And they said, no. Because emotions are not logical. They do not follow logical patterns. Anyone who's had children, anyone who's been married knows these things. Anyone who's led a business knows these things. You look and you think you're well paid, and we're doing our best, and you've got a nice view from your office, and still you're not happy. What's going on? It's to do with this. The water element is a profoundly complex thing. And what has happened to us in our own lives has a very significant effect on this one as well. Um, this one is potentially enormously important for a person's future life chances. And they will do, your, your uh, children will do no examinations around this one at all. No such examination currently exists within conventional curriculum. The air element is the one we're going to spend virtually no time on at all this evening. 
Not because it's not immensely important, but because it's already utterly dominant in Western education. It is the idea of academic and cerebral development. And those students who are good in the air element tend to do very well at school academically. Because it is the, the, the examination testing tends to focus very much on the air element. The air element is a beautiful thing. It is not the purpose of this talk to denigrate or dismiss the air element. That would be really, it would be kind of obscene in a way, I think, actually. The air element split the atom. It put a man on the moon. It abolishes the worst aspects of prejudice and mysticism. The only issue with the air element is that it's not the whole pool game. That's the only real issue. And finally, we have the fire element. And the fire element is really, I mean, they're all just metaphors. In fact, we're using all of them all the time. The fire element is really a metaphor for that which gets me out of bed in the morning beyond the check at the end of the week. It's why I do what I do. It's those moments in life, there's a guy called Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Pennsylvania who wrote a book called Flow, and that book is all about that, the fire element. Ken Robinson, who's a famous uh, uh, education speaker, also wrote a book called The Element, one element, which is about this. It is about every child being able to really find their tribe. And what they, uh, what they mean by that is, um, Find the things that you really love. Some people are multi-tribal. They have many different tribes they could belong to. And others are very clear that there are certain areas that are really their kind of thing. And um, what, your, what Ken Robinson calls your tribe is not necessarily what will happen to you in, the, in your exams. It won't necessarily be connected to that. So this is about finding the things you love. And Chick said behind in his book, you'll say, these are the moments when time passes fastest for you. These are the moments when you think, was that an hour? It felt like five minutes. And you know when you're a long way away from the fire element because you think, with that five minutes, it felt like an hour. And that sort of time is very, uh, time bends a lot in the area of the fire element. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is almost entirely in the fire element. It's all aspiration. There is not one measurable target in the I Have a Dream speech. At no point does he say to the group, I have a strategic plan, please turn to page 19 of your workbooks. There is no such thing in the I Have a Dream speech. It's all aspiration. It's almost entirely based in the fire element. Now there is a warning that comes at the beginning of this, which those of you that are very air element dominant may find this talk quite hard. Because when we're in the shadow of any of these, we find ourselves thinking, what's the point of the other three? Surely this one is the key one. That's, that's a kind of definition of the shadow of any of them. And I'd say that Western culture at the moment is slightly in the shadow of the air element. There is a sense that this one is so dominant that the other three are missing out quite a lot. And that can be a problem because it means that your, your son or daughter may not be able to shine in a way that they can. And when these fringe activities, as they are often arranged at within education, are allowed or come into it, suddenly they start to take off. This is very, very, very significant. Many, by no means all, many of the top leaders I worked with in my old work with Richard Olivier's company were people who had not done very well at school. And this concerned me, I thought, well, why not? The two things should match relatively well. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And this bit is about the gap. This talk is really about the gap, to some degree. Now, for those, let's give it a slightly more air element focus for a moment. We're going to look at two modern interpretations of how we learn and of different forms of education. And I'm going to do this incredibly fast. Both the slides you're about to see are entire books. So you're going to get an entire book in about two minutes. So this is the, if you think, this is a little bit generalized, what you're saying now. My answer is, you bet. Because this is not really what the talk is about, but this gives us a modern interpretation of that. That is the idea of the lead professor of education at Harvard University, a man called Howard Gardner. Gardner argues that there are a series of what he calls multiple intelligences. Some of you have heard this idea before. And he argues, as does Ken Robinson, that they, there is a hierarchy of these intelligences. 
and that Western education has very definitely put these things in a hierarchy, and that this hierarchy doesn't always serve us as well as it might. So let's start with the king and queen of current education. Two very important areas, by the way, not things I am trying to dismiss at all, but nevertheless very much the boss. Linguistic and logical mathematical intelligence. Linguistic language, use of language, uh, um, learning native Portuguese, learning English, very big for this one. Um, by the way, written language tends to be far more focused on in examinations rather than spoken language. So you could have a kid who struggles with writing but is actually incredibly articulate with people and that's not going to show up very much in their examination papers. So linguistic intelligence is both the spoken, the oral, and the written. Logical, mathematical. That's pretty self-explanatory. Kids who are good at maths tend to be good at logical, mathematical intelligence. A kid who is really good at chess tends to be pretty good at logical, mathematical intelligence. These are very good news in terms of exam testing. They are very central. Musical intelligence, that's pretty self-explanatory. But it comes up in many different ways, along with things like bodily kinesthetic intelligence. So for instance, back in the UK, I remember running a, uh, a workshop for some kids at a school in a very tough area of North London. And all the students walked in uh, about uh, five minutes before we were due to start. Their teachers allowed them into the room and they poured in like a river. And I remember there was this one girl, these, a group of friends were all sitting together, and this one girl walked in, and as she walked in and walked towards her friends, she went, Good morning, evening, friends. Here's your friendly announcer. This is a song by Stevie Wonder. And she said, I have serious news. And she's looking at her friends, she went, For you today! And jumped on them. Which one they called her? <laughs> Musical? Or the kinesthetic? She's showing you very, very quickly that she enjoys those two areas. Not every kid walks, especially in London, maybe more here in Rio, but especially in London, not every kid walks into a classroom like that. And when they do, it's telling you something here and here. So she was very rhythmic, she loved music, and she loved movement. Now one of the things that this begins to suggest, and no more than suggest, is that she's going to need to move a lot in order to learn. These are like the folks you work with in business, who when you have an idea, or they have an idea, they will almost immediately be out of their seat and walking around the room. They can't sit still for very long. And it's very hard for them to, to sit for very long and learn. And yet at the same time, we arrange school in a model where you sit behind large desks for long periods of time. This is very tough for some kids. There is a reason for this, folks. Education is changing. And the reason is largely the fault, not entirely, but largely the fault of my home country, the English. The English in the 19th century had a very clear model of education in almost all of their schools, which was this. I, the teacher, know everything. You, the student, know nothing. What you do know that I didn't tell you probably wasn't worth your knowing anyway. It's the detritus of your brain. I will tell you what to think. You will regurgitate it onto an examination paper. I will then take that examination paper from you and mark it. If you learn to speak the way I told you to speak, to think the way I told you to think, you're intelligent. If you didn't, you're stupid and you've got to retake the test. This is absolutely abysmally bad for things like entrepreneurism and creativity. If we train students to think to set patterns, it's much harder for them to break those patterns. It's much harder for them to be independent thinkers. And then, which used to happen to me when I worked in corporate universities, one of the things that used to happen is so many business leaders complaining they're not entrepreneurial enough. They don't think for themselves enough. I'm not getting enough ideas. Because they were many of them put in an education system where they were trained to regurgitate learned information. Now, this has never been less relevant. Because now we have these. <laughs> and the fact is that if I think, for instance, my father, father, my father, man, I love very much, but my father will have an amazing um, uh, 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 brain for recall memory. 
So he could tell you who won the World Cup in you know, this year. He could tell you who was elected president of the United States in 1922. He could tell you, you know, all kinds of big chess moves from um, uh, Alekin versus Capablanca, Buenos Aires, 1928. He could do all that. That does it all now. Way faster. I can find out what happened between Capablanca and Alekin in game four of the World Chess Championship in the 1920s within seconds on this thing. One of my kids um, the other day, well, um, a little while ago, he got an update. The, uh, when he first got given one of these phones, which took a lot of debate, and I'm sure I'm not the only household where this has happened, uh, one of the first things he did all morning, he got it, he, he wired it all up to the Wi Fi in the house, by the way, without my doing anything. He just got it all going within seconds. And then he went, Dad, watch this, and he pressed for Siri, and he went, Ben Walden. And immediately, it just came up with loads of information about me. He goes, check it out, there's you at a conference in New York. Then he said, you know, date of the Battle of Agincourt, Henry V and the Battle of Agincourt against the French, which is one of the things that we do a course on, and there's ten different websites telling you the date of the Battle of Agincourt, pictures from the Battle of Agincourt, historians talking about the Battle of Agincourt. So, this takes us to a new problem which is coming up in just a moment, which is in the second book. And that slide will come to in just a second. Let me finish it. Spatial intelligence is about space in general. So, you, uh, for instance, architects tend to be very spatially intelligent. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence is physical movement. So, Neymar is extremely bodily kinesthetically intelligent, and it's made one of the highest paid human beings in the world. Yeah? I'm not saying that every kid who's bodily kinesthetic is going to be a Neymar or a Messi, but nevertheless, it is a serious, uh, it is a serious business. Even if it's not seen as a serious business, some kids need a lot of it in order to learn well. I have one of my two sons at home, he's very bodily kinesthetic and dominant. The moment he goes near trees or a football or the garden, he wakes up. The moment you put him behind the desk, he goes into a semi-coma. It's just not his kind of thing. Now, it is possible, of course, for a student to be good at all of these things. And such students exist. But we more often have preferences. Naturalist intelligence, I'm not really going to linger on. It's one that God has added, and it's around intelligence in the natural world. And he thinks it was part of our early tribal system for identification and, projection and protection of the tribe. I'm not going to linger on it now. But it means kids are really good at spotting stuff. So it's things like... A kid being able to go, that's an Inter Milan away shirt, but from three years ago. And you go, oh, really? I don't know, I don't know, I don't really watch that. They're like, yeah, no, that was the one, they changed it, and it was a different sponsor. It's also kids being able to say, that's a Ferrari such and such from this year, this made this model. So they understand patterns and identify what things look like. They think it was to do with early tribal gathering and uh, how we use that to identify friend, foe, things we can eat, things we can't. But he's now determined to make it an extra intelligence. It's not the one we're going to focus on so much tonight. And finally, we have here interpersonal and intrapersonal. I really like this definition, and I'll explain why. Gardner believes that there are two forms of emotional intelligence, essentially. One, my ability to influence you. Two, my understanding of myself. He argues they are not the same thing. And it is quite possible for a person to be really good at external influence, but they're an emotional nightmare underneath it. So that you think, this person is very dangerous in things like politics. This is someone who could be amazing at getting you to vote for me, and then you go home and meet me, and you're like, my God, it's, they're a void. They're not really there. It's like they've developed an incredible persona, but the inner knowledge is not good at all. They've learned amazing amounts about how to say what you need me to say, rather than it's my own natural understanding. Uh, in, uh, intrapersonal intelligence is my own natural understanding. And that person may be hugely emotionally intelligent, but they're not necessarily brilliant at being able to talk to you about that. The balance is where the two are, are working well together, and that often happens, but they don't always happen. Gardner calls these the emotional intelligence skills, like, like Daniel Goldman did in his best-selling book. And Gardner argues, whether right or wrong, that these should be at the heart of education. Because he thinks that more than any others, they determine a young person's well-being and future life chances. Now, that's debatable, but that's where he feels they lie. 
And certainly in terms of leadership, Gardner has these right at the top. There is no examination in these two. No examination in these two. The exams are mainly up here. So that's one thing. The second is around the mind as it now is developing with so much mobile phone technology. This is from a book that some of you may have read called A Whole New Mind by a guy called Daniel Pink. It's been an international bestseller. Here's what I most like about this book. It was written 15 years ago, and he just seems to be becoming more and more right the further we go into the century. So I reread it recently, because I've been uh, asking people to look at it for a while, and I found it's incredible. It, is, it, is, it, it, it seems to be getting things absolutely spot on so far. Here's what he argues, and again, I'm going to be pretty quick about this. He argues that. There are what he calls three A's that now dominate our culture. He calls them Asia, automation, and abundance. Asia. If it can be outsourced to Asia cheaper, there's not much point teaching kids much about that because you'll find the jobs are all in Bangladesh. Automation. If a computer can do it faster and cheaper, not much point learning too much about that because you're going to find the computer does it. And indeed, one of the things he predicts, the students will just use the computer to do it and think, I don't really need that skill quite so much anymore. And the third one is abundance. Now, this, is, this was written, you know, it depends where one is in the world, it depends on the time, it depends on the social group you belong to. But he says, in a world where there is far more affluence, people want far more choice. So there was a time that when we got a corkscrew for a bottle, we'd go, oh, well, fantastic, it opens the bottle, brilliant, that's all you need it to be. I remember when I was a kid, corkscrews were very basic. He argues that with growing abundance and affluence, people want mega amazing corkscrews. The corkscrew has also got Wi-Fi connection, and it can test the temperature of the wine while you open it. And he argues that then there is a, therefore a massive need now for design for students to think, I can't just invent a chair. I've got to invent a chair that has Wi-Fi and can also be used as a motorized vehicle because that's how we're going to make a million dollars and do something that no one on the market has done yet because everyone's got a chair these days. So he argues that with abundance, you have to develop the game, the game rises. Now people want more fun. They want more play. They want more imaginative possibilities. So we're not just in the conventional old-fashioned systems, partly because of that. Here are the things he believes that are therefore very important. Design, that's the one around being able to do things more intricately. Story, yeah, I don't think this one is new. I have to say, I don't think, and meaning, we can put these together, I don't think this one is new. He argues, as does Gardner, that, and this, we worked with the students on this this morning, that a key aspect of leadership is the ability to create compelling narratives. In other words, to tell stories that leave people going, whoa, that, whoa I, that's good, I'm on board. If you don't think that is true, just check who is the current president of the United States. <laughs> no one could accuse him of being a towering giant of intellect. But he created, for many people, not for everyone, a highly compelling narrative. Likewise, if you wonder why the British made the pretty, um, I would say, um, radical step of deciding they were better severing themselves from the whole rest of Europe and leaving the European Union, think which is the more compelling narrative, whether one agrees with it or not, which is, it's better not to rock the boat, is one narrative, or we could have our freedom as we once had it. Guess which proved to be the more compelling narrative, even if it isn't necessarily true. So compelling narratives, both Gardner and Pink argue, are incredibly important. I would propose that your students, your, you know, that our students, your children, my children, need to learn about compelling narrative. And if your son and daughter is really good at telling compelling narratives, you are in business. That is potentially worth as much as a really good university degree. Because one of the things it's going to give your son or daughter the chance to do is to be able to go, well, the thing is, I, I didn't do that great in the exams, but let me tell you a bit about who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And suddenly, that all starts to matter less and less and less, and their ability to bring you on board with how they feel and why they're doing what they're doing goes up and up and up and up. 
And in many businesses, by no means all, for instance in medicine this would not necessarily be the case, but in many businesses people will go, they've all got identical grades. I don't know who to choose. I'll choose the one who just came in and was the most interesting personality and looked the, the, like the person I could most easily work with and who was the most memorable in the interview. And there are other jobs where you would go, the grade doesn't matter very much anyway. Show me the person who's going to be walking into the room. And that's where this stuff becomes quite important. So that's story and meaning. Play is about that with abundance we have more room for things. One of, the, one of the fastest growing businesses of the last 20 years is the whole gaming industry. Sony, uh, Sony um, now owns a large part of Hollywood and a large part of the gaming industry. And the gaming industry absolutely dwarfs what they're doing in Hollywood. Hollywood is very small fry compared to that now. Empathy, again, is emotional intelligence skills. And symphony is a really interesting one. It is the ability to multitask and, do, and see connections between things that were not previously seen as connected. So for instance, um, this is a very interesting educational style, which many favor, and which my current government in the UK loathe, because they like taking things a bit more back to the 1950s. One of the ways that you could study many subjects is to, for instance, just look at a country. So you could be a student in England and say, this term we are studying Brazil. And you can look at the Brazilian economy, Brazilian politics, Brazilian geography, Brazilian sport, Brazilian food, and learn physics, mathematics, engineering, sports, everything through the lens of a combined topic, Brazil. Um, so that is a very different way of seeing it from the old method of we do physics, we do chemistry, we do English, we do history, and they are different classes in different rooms at different times. This is about being able to spot patterns, pattern recognition. And this is a major 21st century skill in a world that is faster and faster moving, and in many ways more and more chaotic in terms of the amount of information available. Does that make sense? This requires a whole new mind. Now, I wouldn't quite go as far as me. I wouldn't say it requires a whole new mind. Because I don't think that, for instance, our generation are doing that badly. Or that we know nothing. Or that everything we've ever learned in our lifetimes is now hopelessly outdated. It just isn't fair to say that. But there are new things that are coming on board. And what we're going to look at now is how we help our, uh, our children and also us as parents. Because I don't know about you. I have found that being a parent has been the biggest leadership challenge of my life. The most difficult and also the most rewarding. So that will all come into this. So have a look at this. Have a look at this for yourself and have a look at this. This is bodily kinesthetic the earth. Have a look at this for yourself and for your son, stroke, daughter, whatever, whatever it might be. Folks who are good here tend to be physically grounded, have vocal power and clarity, be relaxed and centered, and can develop the environment, they're sensitive to environment, which has something to do with spatial intelligence as well, to support learning. So if you have a son or daughter who moves a lot, likes to dance, likes drama, likes sports, we're coming into this realm. That doesn't mean that's all they are, they're all of them, but it means they have real interests here. And a lot of learning needs to be focused on this. And how are you with this one? Do you look at that and go, I like all that stuff? Or do you look at that and go, no, yeah, that's not really so much me. I do it, we all do it, but it wouldn't be so much me. This is an absolutely vital one, for instance, in teaching. Absolutely vital. And it's amazing to me that it isn't a more important part of teacher training. Because it doesn't matter how good a man or a woman's degree is, if they're not strong here, they're going to have enormous trouble with students. Especially some of the students I work with, maybe not at the British School of Rio, but in some of the really tough areas of the UK. Where when they walk into the room, most of, you, most of those kids will look at you like you are a disease. They don't want to be there. They don't understand why they're at school. One, a lot of those kids will say, the reason I'm here is because it's the law. It'd be against the law for me not to be here. And if you don't have skills there, they are never, ever going to respond to you. They are going to find you very, very difficult to listen to. And I remember meeting a teacher, for instance, once who was absolutely amazing here. In fact, he was good in all four. And it was an unforgettable experience. I've met many teachers who are really good in this. But I remember a guy at a school in Peckham in southeast London 
where a big housing estate overlooked the school. Many of the students were from that housing estate. And I went in to do Romeo and Juliet with them. And the students all walked in. And the teacher latched the door for them. And then as they sat, they sat a bit like you're sitting now. He came and stood about here as they were walking in, looking at them. And uh, he would say things to them like, Lee, Lee, Claire. John. They were very centered, very calm. And once he got them in the centered and calm, which took him very little time, he then went, Shakespeare! This guy is a lead actor from the Globe Theatre in London. That's only about three miles down the road from here, but you're never going to go there unless we make you, so we brought him to you. We're going to look at Romeo and Juliet. This is a play about what we love and why we love it. And it's a play about what we hate and why we hate it. We're going to look at all those big feelings that can get us all in so much trouble, but can also cause us to have so much fun. And we're going to do that through the lens of one of the greatest poet, dramatist speakers who has ever lived, William Shakespeare. We're going to have a gang war. We're going to put on bandanas. We're going to wear face paint. We're going to do all that in just two hours to realize why this man is such an incredible writer and why he is so relevant to you. Ben. And I don't remember looking at him and thinking they've wasted their money. <laughs> they didn't need to bring me here. This guy is so good with these students in this area that he's doing a lot of the work for them. And all, uh, all of us at school will also occasionally have had teachers um, who uh, were uh, a bit uh, like this and um, who would speak, largely reading from a textbook or changing slides like that. And you will look up at the room and half the room is asleep. So this is the other one. And as a final word on this, there is a group in England called Teach First. Teach First is an idea that the British government had to take outstanding um, students in terms of their degree and make them teachers. And sometimes it works brilliantly. You get a really bright teacher who's engaged and they want to go into teaching where they're not going to earn the highest amount of money. It's fantastic. But they do virtually nothing to focus on that. And then people like me get called in to work with them on those skills because they're like, I've got an amazing degree in, 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 you know, I've got an amazing engineering degree. Why aren't any of these students listening to me? Mm -hmm. Because there's a problem here. Yeah. Also, there can be a problem here. Have a look at this one. Empathetic, reassuring, builds trust, receptive, sensitive to the feelings of the group. If your son or daughter is strong here, they feel a lot. I have to say, in Brazilian culture, you guys feel more than the British anyway. Which is one of the reasons that my partner is Argentine, and one of the reasons why I don't always spend all my time in England. Uh, because uh, I, I happen to really enjoy this, and I happen to think South Americans are better at it than English people. That's, that's a bit of a generalization, but that would be my opinion. And um, when your son or daughter has a lot of this, they feel a lot. So um, they see something, it makes them cry. They come home and go, oh my god, it's so sad, what happened? Or they come home and go, you will not believe it, I am so angry! And, um, all of it is this. Some students come home and go, you know, even brothers and sisters can be completely different like this. The brother looks at the sister, or the sister looks at the brother and goes, you're so melodramatic, and there's so much emotion all the time, why don't you just calm down? And the other one looks and goes, why can't you be more emotional, more dramatic? This is the realm here, but it is not necessarily melodramatic. Some people are very quietly emotionally intelligent. They are more introvert, but they are highly emotionally intelligent. And they're very sensitive to feeling. And as a rule, children in general, although not all, but many children are very good naturally here, especially when they're very small. Then it's not such a focus of education, so it can go away. But when we are very little, if our parents have a row, an argument, but we didn't actually see it, children are amazingly good at walking into a room and going, something's wrong. There's a weird feeling in here. Why did he? He just looked. She. She. I feel sad. 
they're just picking up naturally on this. By the time we're 40, we can be so busy in our heads that we wouldn't notice if the other person fell over. That can happen. So this is um, about emotional sensitivity, and crucially, this is not an intellectual process. It's an emotional one. So a kid can be highly emotionally intelligent, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they could write an amazing paper about emotional intelligence for Harvard University. What it means is that they can sit with the person who is writing that paper mm -hmm. and go, you seem a bit sad. It's like you seem lonely for all this amazing all the university stuff that's going on. Are you married? Would you like to be married? They're much more interested in the actual feelings. This is not an intellectual process, it's an emotional one. Does that make sense? Okay. The Center of Western Education. Logical, analytical, structured, mindful, rational, deductive. Beautiful, profound stuff. Split the app and put a man on the moon, but not the whole ball game. And that alone does not an outstanding leader, father, mother, brother, sister, politician, doctor, lawyer, actor, whatever make. You can't do it with just that. A computer can have just that. I'd say a human being has to be quite a lot more. And finally, this one. And the thing about this one is that. I propose all of, our stu all of our children, all students, should leave school with some sense of that. There needs to be a bit of a sense of, this is why I'm coming every day, that puts a spring in my step. Beyond just the examinations I've got to pass. There's something in this that I love, or that really engages me. And they will show you what interests them from quite an early age. Now, it can change, but they will show you where the fire element is for them. They won't necessarily tell you verbally, but you'll see it in how things interest them. What they stop to look at on the television screen. The stuff that they talk about. Or in some cases, it's even more subtle than that. So let me give you an example of this, and then I'm going to hand over to you to talk about it for a minute. I worked at a school in another tough part of the UK called Stoke. Many of you, if you ever go to the UK, will never go to Stoke. And you're probably not missing very much. Uh, and uh, there was a kid in this school I was at who walked into the talker gate like this. And he didn't look up at all. Not when I was introduced, not anything. He was noticeable. He was at the silent group. He radiated, I do not want to be here. So anyway, we started, and about three minutes, five, about five minutes into the talk, I mentioned the great Brazilian motor racing driver, Ayrton Senna, and he did this. That was it. So for those of you who couldn't quite see that, he simply went, that was it. No, oh, nothing like that, just look. Anyway, I noticed that. The next exercise, he couldn't do it. People, the students started working together, and he just sat there. And I went over to him and said, are you OK? Do you want to uh, And he said, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, it doesn't mean much to me. And I said, OK, let me come back to you in a minute. So we got the whole group together again. And I said to him, do you like motor racing? And he went, no, yes, I do, actually. But I said, you are Ayrton Senna? And he went, yeah. I said, I thought so, because when I mentioned Senna, you looked up, and he went, immediately looked at me. I said, like, well, you know, he was determined that I wasn't going to get to know anything about it. Yeah? So then I said, I'm just going to ask you another couple of questions. Do you like speed? And he went, like what? I said, like going fast in cars. And he went, yeah. And I said, do you like mechanics? Are you interested in working on cars? And he went, yes. It's his sense of purpose. Very slowly emerging out of the quagmire. And I said, OK, if I could bring a car in here now for you to work on, would that interest you? And he went, yeah, with quite a lot of anger. And I said, so do you feel that school addresses your interest in mechanics? And he went, no. Now his sense of purpose is coming right up. The volume's coming right up. The anger's coming right up. He's much more engaged now, even if it's in quite a negative way. 
And I said, mm -hmm. so if we could find a way to learn like maths, history, English through mechanics and through working on cars, would that interest you? And he was like, yeah. And he smiled. Yeah. That sense of purpose. Does that make sense? That's the fire element. But it might just be a look, a moment. Some people who you may work with in your office, their sense of purpose goes up the moment they start complaining about things. <laughs> So when you're trying to like infuse people, they're not infused. But something goes wrong, and they immediately go, well, that just shows, doesn't it? You see, none of this works, is what I'm saying. That shows that there is a sense of purpose there. It's just coming out in a very inverted way. So this one is very important for leadership, but I think it's very important for communication skills as well. And it's certainly very important in things like teaching, to be inspired by what you do. Here's what I'm going to give you a moment to, to look at. There's the fire, back again to the air, the water, the earth. Now you might say, well, we use all of them, and indeed we do. But the question I'm going to ask you is, where do your preferences lie? Which ones do you look at and go, I think I like that one. That's a bit of a favorite for me. I also really like that one. This one doesn't engage me quite so much. I have to work a bit harder at that. And where do you think the preferences lie for your son or daughter, sons or daughters? Where do you think their uh, interests lie? The idea is to be amazing in all four. If you were amazing in all four, you didn't really. If your if your child is amazing in all four, you didn't really need to come to this talk. It is very unusual. It is very unusual. But when it happens, you have what the Elizabethans would have called, and forgive the gender. Um, prejudice here, it's to do with the Elizabethan world. You would have what the Elizabethans would have considered a Renaissance man. A Renaissance man means a person who is so good at so many things that they're like an artist of life. They're an amazing, the Hamlet is supposed to be a Renaissance man, but he's too depressed to care. Yeah? He's an amazing swordsman. He's brilliant with literature. He can act. He's fantastic at sport. He's handsome, debonair, attractive, intellectually precise, everything. A Renaissance man. Now, of course, we'd say person, not man. It would be, gender would be irrelevant. This is someone who's, for whom life is almost art because they are so skilled emotionally, physically, mentally, and if you like, spiritually, or in terms of sense of purpose. It's quite rare. But it is possible, and it is the it is the ball game basically. So I'm going to give you a moment to talk about where do I think my children's preferences lie here, and where are my preferences bearing in mind we use the ball. Let me give you a couple of minutes to discuss that with each other. Or if you if you're sitting on your own, please others engage. You you are Brazilians. You're much better at being friendly than the English are. Engage others. Yeah. Can you just describe what a physically grounded person would be like? Yeah, the guy who. Gave the talk to the kids about Romeo and Juliet. Physical presence. Yeah. Comes in and everyone notices him. Yeah. No, not necessarily everyone notices him, but that he's physically grounded. So what I mean by that is that it's not that he walks in and he's a bull of charisma, because some very charismatic people are not very suited to a leadership role. They can be incredibly unethical. So this alone does not determine ethics. What it does mean is that he's very comfortable in his body. It's not about being good looking. It's about a man or woman who is very comfortable in their body. So for instance, when they say hello, if they know you well enough, you'll get a hug. If the music comes on on the dance floor, they start dancing like this, as opposed to going, oh, I hate dancing. <laughs> yeah. If a football comes near them, or they play, or they do gymnastics, or they'll, they'll probably be a sport that they quite enjoy. If they don't enjoy sport, they're likely to enjoy drama. It's very grounded like that. Uh, 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 Actors spend three years of drama school training to be physically grounded. So that, for instance, when you have to play Hamlet at the Global Theatre, you can walk on stage and talk about huge emotions and stay very physically relaxed. That is what we might call physical grounding. Does that make sense? So that's what we mean by that one. Okay. Let me hand over to you folks and give you two, three minutes to talk about this with each other. Then we're going to look at a couple of key things to do with this. Bring, if, if someone has no one to talk to, bring them in to talk to you.
understand you, or I don't quite get, or I would like to ask a question around, uh, please feel free to do so. Let me just check before we go on. All make sense so far? Okay, so then what we're going to look at in the last part of this is, well, yeah, so what? So what do we do with that? How do we make it work in a way that's useful for us and for our children? Because there is no way it can be just about the children or just about us, it's about all of us, really. So, um, that I don't have a great deal to add for this one right now. I told you a little bit about it with the, um, with the teacher that we work with. But uh, one of the things that I would just say about this is notice for your own son or daughter, indeed for ourselves, but all of us, how you are with being seen. Yeah? So there are some students who are very good at written testing, very good, very academically able, but you ask them to stand in front of a group and it's a nightmare. So they stand in front of the group and um, they feel incredibly self-conscious. And there's an amazing, beautiful mind in here. The air element is working really well. They have loads of useful things to share. But now they've diminished themselves about 90% because it's so excruciating being seen. And um, they find that really difficult and they turn towards the PowerPoint and they love that because that can protect them and they can hide behind it and they don't, they're not necessarily very good communicators. And another kid who's not doing very well in class might actually be very confident in front of a group, and he or she stands up and they can hold the room much better. So this is partly an earth element skill. And the thing to notice for ourselves is, when do I belittle myself? Um, when do I shut down? When do I start to close? We have loads of little micro moments in life when we start to close ourselves off. A very obvious one is two people have an argument near you. A lot of us will go, don't want to notice that, don't want to see that. A child will do that if parents are arguing around them often. And we close down. But there are many other areas of life where we do it, and you can often see it physically. So if you say to someone, Hi, how are you doing? And they go, yeah, good, hi, nice to meet you. Look at that. And me, there was this. So the, there's a guy called Albert Moravian who did a really um, influential piece of work for UCLA, University College Los Angeles, around what people pick up on when they meet you. And he named three key things. How I come over as a person, the tone of my voice, and the content of my material. In other words, the actual words coming out of my mouth. And this has a very major message for corporate leaders who have to give big presentations. Because he identified, and the research is all on the internet, if you want to look at it in more detail, it's not the main point of our talk tonight. 60% how I come over as a person. 30% the tone of my voice. 10% content of my written material. And yet when you go into the corporate world, people will spend 90% of the time preparing the content of a, of a talk. And 10% on how I'm going to do it. And actually, the 10% on how I'm going to do it was really, really, really important. And, you know, they get interrupted by their boss in the first line, or they lose where they were, or they feel really nervous, and they're actually very useful and important data, and their research can get dismissed too easily because the 90% wasn't in place. We do loads of examinations on content. We do none on how I come over as a person or uh, my, the tone of my voice. So um, there's a lot around that, and the thing to notice for our children and for ourselves is where do I check out, where do I look down, where do I get small, where do I find myself cutting off. It's like being on, it's like um, when, you, when you check your phone in for internet, but the internet connection is not very good, and you're online and then you're not, and you're halfway through the call and it's gone again. We can get like that in ourselves, and that won't necessarily show up in exams. So where are the points where your kids check out a lot, or find it more difficult to be present, or you find it more difficult to be present? That is part of this one. Does that make sense? Uh, and it can happen to any of us. Uh, uh, some kids who are quite confident will go, I don't have that problem. Imagine if they met someone incredibly famous. Often then, our self-esteem nosedives. If you meet one of the world's most famous rock stars or politicians or all of that, even a person who normally would say, oh, I'm pretty confident, when they meet them, will go, oh. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I have a picture of you 
<laughs> it's amazing. I remember meeting Al Pacino at the Globe, who was uh, my absolute hero as an actor. And Pacino was very small, and he was by the coffee machine. And I was introduced to him by the guy who runs the theatre's wife, who was the head of music. And she said to me, Ben, come and meet Al. And I remember going, Goo! And there was Pacino, and um, she said, Al, you've seen Ben before because you saw him do a play Speed in Two Gentlemen of Verona on Broadway. And Pacino said to me, hey Ben. And I remember thinking, that's it, man. I'm shaking the hand of Michael Corleone. Holy <laughs> <laughs> shit, that's his actual man. And he went, so Ben, it's like I'm kind of following your career with interest. <laughs> And I remember I couldn't speak. I just went, yeah, it's like that. I could hardly speak to him. And afterwards, he was very friendly, and afterwards I thought I really blew that. I would have loved have to have asked him a thousand questions. And I was too nervous. So it can happen to any of us. And the question then becomes, what is it in me that felt I was not worthy? Yeah. To a lot of students, I'll say something like, if you met, say, Beyonce, would you be able to go, if, you, if it's true, would you be able to go, I really like your music, by the way. Will you sign my album? Thank you. By the way, you're also very pretty. Just thought I'd say that. I know you're married to a very wealthy, successful guy, but I just thought I'd say, you're very pretty. Or would you more go, oh my god, oh my god. Yeah. What would happen to you? This is a really good test of our self-esteem. A really good test of our self-esteem. Let's have a look here. This is the bit I'm going to focus on a little more in the time we have left. <clears throat> emotional intelligence, in Daniel Goleman's internationally best-selling book, which is called Emotional Intelligence, uh, is, he argues is understanding our own feeling states more deeply and giving them appropriate expression, and being sensitive to the feeling states of others and giving that appropriate acknowledgement. He argues that that is a key life skill and also a key education skill. But we're going to look at it in that. We're going to look at it in a different way. I'm going to put up a list of the primary emotions, as they are sometimes called. And what I'm going to ask you as we go through this, this is really important for us as parents, is which ones do you feel pretty confident with, and which ones do you look at and go, that's not so much my kind of thing. I struggle with that emotion, and I don't feel very comfortable if people express it around me. They are not in an order of importance, but this is such a parenthood theme that I thought I'd spend a bit longer on this one as a central bit. So, not in order of importance, but here we go. Joy. How joyful are you? I have to say that although I know only a little bit about the country, I would say that I think Brazil is quite good at this one. Even though there are many difficulties here, I appreciate that, there is a lot of joy in Brazilian culture. This is not the greatest skill of my home country, the British. Yeah? There, are, there are a couple of voices around that. One is a slightly British prejudice among some, the fair, in fair it's not all, that happy slightly means stupid. <laughs> stupid people are happy a lot. They're the ones who get up on the dance floor and just dance, and they ignore the fact that the world has very serious problems at this time. Yeah? <laughs> well, you can still have joy and have the ignorance of the fact that the world has very serious problems at this time. And my partner was Argentine. When she first came to England, used to often say to me, Oh my God, why are you people so serious? <laughs> and she listened to things like the radio, the morning radio, and then you know, things like the Today program in the UK. The Today program, which is very serious and very analytical, and the Prime Minister comes on and talks very seriously about very serious things. She sort of go, I'm so bored by listening to this. <laughs> you know, uh, can we put some music on? Yeah. So, Joy, how joyful are you if someone says to you, this happened to me today. Are you good at being able to go, hey, that is fantastic. Well done, you. Or are you uh, more the kind of person who would struggle with that kind of thing? If someone came up to you and said, I've got some amazing news. My sister's coming back from Australia and I've missed her so much and I'm so happy. Are you more the kind of person who would go, hey, that is great and I know how much you miss her. Or would you quietly think, <laughs> if you do go to 
for instance, university in England, remember the English are a lot more friendly than they appear. Because <laughs> to begin with, you'll work very hard to get them to say warm things. You have to kind of earn it a bit more. One of the things I love about South America is people will be much more friendly, much more quickly on the whole. That was my experience here. So, how are you with that one? You might say, well, that's very nice, Ben. That might be important for parenthood. But it's not necessarily that important in their careers. Oh, no. Bill Clinton, who didn't do badly in his career, Working class kid from Hope, Arkansas, brought up by his mum, his father killed in a car crash before he was born. Clinton was asked at Davos, the World Economic Forum, what are key components of leadership? And Clinton's first answer, he had, this, he's, he's appeared at Davos several times, but his answer this time was, nobody in their right minds wants to be led by a pessimist. So how are you with grounded openness and optimism? Not mindless openness and optimism, but grounded openness and optimism. This is a major life skill and a major well-being factor. So that's one. The second, if you thought that was bad, wait for the second one. <laughs> Love. Now, again, in my own country, the UK, at some point, people, some people at this point will go, you know, what, what do you mean? What's that got to do with the major issues of leadership? I would say a massive amount. One of the main problems I found in the corporate world was a lack of that in leadership. So in other words, many people would get up as chief executives of big, you know, big uh, mobile phone companies, cement companies, gas companies, and stand at a lectern, very protected, in a big auditorium, a long way away from their staff, and start talking about the data and the strategy and the year's figures, and well done to those working in our Asian markets where we've seen a 13% growth in the last four quarters and all of that. And very few of them, not all, but very few, were good at coming out from behind the lectern, standing with the group, and saying something like, how's everyone doing? Do you even know me? How many of you even met me? If you met me going out of this auditorium to get a cup of coffee, would you feel comfortable being able to speak to me? Or would you feel like, well, I can't speak to you? Why do we do what we do? In a minute, I'm going to go through all these figures around what money we've made this year. Why are we making it? What's the purpose of it? What do we serve in the world beyond just shareholder value? And do we really speak honestly with each other about what's working well and what is not? And do we do that respectfully, but clearly? That was really unusual. When I did see it, what people would leave the auditorium going is, Wow, thank God we're led by them. What an amazing man or woman to be led by. But you didn't see it very often, and it had something to do with this. And I have just one story for you around this, which really, for me, says it all. What well, the best story I have ever heard from any conference or any group anywhere about leadership. A few years ago, I worked at a school in Switzerland, and there's a quote at the end of this talk in a few minutes' time by Nelson Mandela. And this girl came up to me. She was a sixth-born kid at a school in Switzerland. She was from South Africa, and she said, Ben, I've met Nelson Mandela. And I said, you're kidding me. What was that like? This is the story she told me. And I asked people, I asked her if I could tell people all around the world the story. And she said, oh, yeah, definitely. She was very pleased about that. So this is from her to you, kind of with me as the vehicle that brings it to you. When she was six years old, Mandela came to her school in South Africa, and she was put on a welcoming committee. And this was incredibly important to her. And her family was so excited, and of course the school was so excited, and the big day came. And one of her teachers said to her, if you ask him for a hug, he might give you one. So anyway, in walks Nelson Mandela. She's six years old, remember. And she was so nervous, she could hardly look at him. And she stood in a line waiting to meet him. And her turn came, and she couldn't even look and he said hello and she went hello and just looked at him and then he nodded at her and walked on. Now she's six so her impulse control was not amazingly good. She was so upset with herself. She thought that was it. That was my chance to meet him. And I just blew it completely. I will never get that chance again. Oh my god, I'm so stupid. And she couldn't handle it. So she stepped out of the line and she went, 
Madiba, which is his trite name. And the whole welcoming committee and Mandela and everyone turned around to look at her. And what she said to me is at that point she thought, what have I done? <laughs> but it was too late. Everyone, including one of the most famous figures of the 20th century, was now looking at her. So she said to Mandela, can I have a hug? Right? And her exact words were, he just laughed. And he said, of course. So he came back to her, and he gave her a big hug, and then at that point the whole line broke, and all the students came to hug him and get a hug around him, and he was hugging like everyone at the same time. And everyone started laughing, it broke the whole atmosphere. So through her honesty and her heart, she showed real leadership. She showed real leadership. This did not escape his eagle eye. Because as all the kids were breaking away again, and she was talking to her friend, she looked up and Mandela was still looking straight at her. And he said to her, good luck to you. And he walked on. And what she said was, Ben, he just made me feel like I was the only person in the world. Now that is something which should be part of the curriculum in school. Mandela, think of Mandela's life, the appalling racial prejudice he suffered, not even allowed to attend his own son's funeral when he was killed while he was on Robben Island. He could have become an immensely bitter man, and he responded with that. This is a real leader. This is someone really suited to a leadership role, who's probably fought many internal battles to get to this place. So um, this is a really important leadership skill. Now the last three are sometimes called negative emotions, which is a little unfair because they're not necessarily negative. Fear. We would look at this with the students this morning. How fearful are you and how many of your decisions are based in fear? Nothing wrong with fear. We'd never have got out of our primordial past without it. You wouldn't be able to cross a road in Rio de Janeiro without it. You know, if you have no sense of fear, imagine driving a car. Red light. Way! Sorry. No impulse control, no sense of fear. So fear is a very necessary limiting emotion. But we sometimes develop very irrational fears. What are yours? How much are you projecting them onto your children? How much do you already beat yourself up for that? Which is a pretty useless thing to do because it's not going to make it, it's not going to reverse the process. The way to reverse the process is to be more consciously aware of what I'm doing. We've all done it. Please don't think I stand here going, I have never, never projected an unconscious fear of mine onto my children. I'm too psychologically advanced for that. What utter nonsense. I've spotted myself sometimes doing it in mid-sentence. Yeah. Where are you with that? Where are you more nervous like that? This has got nothing to do, by the way, with things like socioeconomic grouping. You can go into a very affluent household and there's a lot of fear in that household. You know, a kid, um, someone buys some very expensive plates and it's, uh, everyone's meeting for Sunday lunch. And one of the children takes the plates to walk towards the table and drops them and smashes them. Now, if we're lucky, mom, dad, whoever comes up and goes, oh, oh no, no. Those were really expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, you were only trying to help. Don't worry, let's get a dust pan and brush. But it's quite possible that mom, dad, whoever, in this otherwise relatively healthy household, will walk up and go, Oh, Prince! Oh! Oh, why didn't you ask for help? And the kid goes, And we can do that 20 times a week if we're not careful. So just noticing that is the key thing. What are my fears and where am I projecting them onto my children in an unhelpful way? And finally, anger and sadness. Very closely related, these two. How angry are you? If you ask a group of five-year-olds, how angry are you? Almost the entire room will put their hand up. Though I experience anger quite a lot. You ask a group of 45 year olds how angry they are, and virtually no one in the room will voluntarily put their hand up. And meanwhile, their husband and wife might be sitting with them going, oh, you can be pretty angry, let me tell you. Or, you know, a classroom teacher who the students are going, you can get angry quite a lot, or whatever it might be. But we don't talk about it because this is seen as the great, dirty, nasty, ugly emotion. Yeah? 
And of course, if we use it to hurt ourselves or others, then it can be a very ugly emotion. But the, what I propose is that anger on its own is not necessarily bad. It's how we use it. Nelson Mandela was very angry about the treatment of black South Africans. It doesn't mean that he was emotionally distorted in some great way. How we express anger is a massive sign of emotional intelligence. Some people are much more naturally prone to anger. Some people have, have grown up with anger as a great survival mechanism. Some kids who are very, very angry, you, if you explored their past, you would, you would see that without that anger, they might never have got here now. So actually, it was a really good coping strategy in a certain situation, which is now really inappropriate in many other situations. So anger is a very complex emotion, and the main thing that I would ask here is how are you at staying present when you are angry? Because we tend to be very bad at that. There's a neurological reason for it. The brain works differently when we're very, very angry. The brain takes on a much more kind of primitive response system. But uh, let's talk about, for instance, between a husband or a wife, or when you're having an argument with one of your children, or your children say something very rude or hurtful to you which I think most parents would be experienced at some point along the way. At those moments, are you able to stay present with them? Because when we get angry with each other, that's very hard. Someone says, well, I think this, and the other person goes, right, well, I, mean, I think that. And then the other person goes, oh, okay, fine. What I want to say is, now we're not relating to each other. We're really not. We're off in our own worlds of anger. How are you at being able, when someone is angry, and you feel angry, to look at them and stay present? And, and be, even be able to say to them, I am so angry. But, you know, in a way, I mean, it would be difficult to say this in many situations, but to almost say in a way, you know what, I could, I could hit you right now in the face. I really could. I am not angry. But that's not going to help. Please don't speak to me like that. Here's three reasons why I'm so angry about what you've just done or said. But we tend not to do that. We tend to go, okay, well, if you feel that way, if you don't, I'll be angry about you, or whatever it might be. And we just go off into our separate zones. How are you at staying present when angry and managing anger? And how are we at embodying anger for our children? So, in other words, how are you at being able to not deny anger? but be angry in a way that our kids can learn how to manage anger well. Does that make sense? How are you being able to manage that emotion well? I've watched myself do it really badly sometimes. I remember walking into a room and my kids have like spilled something all over the floor, or they like trashed the TV, and instead of going like, okay, this is totally unacceptable, and we've talked about this, and now there's gonna be consequences. I walked in and gone, oh my God! And then thought, look at that. That won't have actually help. Does this make sense? So how do we model it well? Not, not feel it, feel it, but model it well. This is a major emotional intelligence thing. And finally, sadness. How are you with sadness? How are you with being tearful? Uh, this is changing a lot in society. But when I was a kid, to cry was considered very weak for a boy. I remember standing by a side of a football field with, my, with a really good friend of mine, age about 10, remember we were English, and uh, I remember saying, I probably haven't cried for about a year. And my friend said, I probably haven't cried for about three years. Because <laughs> crying was weak. And it was something girls did. Boys don't cry. Th this is not helpful. This is not a good way for young men to manage grief and sadness. Because later, when they're married, they're going to find it very difficult when they're upset to express that well if they feel ashamed the moment they feel tearful. So if I feel tearful, and now I feel ashamed, I'm likely to express that really inappropriately or unhealthily. Because I feel bad just having the emotion. But there's no real reason why I should have to feel bad having the emotion. So we have to really work out how we express these things appropriately. These are not necessarily negative. These are often a sign of amazing maturity when we express them well. Here's a quote by William Blake, the great English poet and artist. Blake said this about the emotional life in a poem called Augury's of Innocence. He said, 
Joy and woe are woven fine. Or happiness and sadness, we like the equals of joy and woe. Joy and woe are woven fine. A clothing for the soul divine. Under every Greek is very, really useful when you're having a tough time in life, or someone you love just died, or something really tough just happened. Joy and woe are woven fine. A clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. It is right it should be so. We were made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly go, safely through the world we go. Safely through the world we go. I, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the most emotionally intelligent things. William Blake, William one of the most famous of Blake, the, the great artist and also yeah. writer. But, uh, and the poem is from a very long poem called Auguries of Innocence. It's in the middle of it. Yeah. Okay. So, our last few moments, because we're going to come to an ending here, is going to be around the point. And I just want to say a couple of things around this before I just give you one quote that will really end our part of the, the talk tonight. The first is to say that who your children really admire and what they love doing will tell you a lot about fire and I had one uh, student in the class this morning, many of them, by the way, it's very interesting the cultural differences in the UK and in the United States, when you ask who do you really admire, most people will name famous people. When you ask it in Brazil and Argentina and some other countries I've worked in, they name family members. This is quite a culturally interesting thing, I think. Uh, and um, uh, one kid today though did name a famous person, he, he said Winston Churchill. He said, I really admire Winston Churchill. My dad admires Winston Churchill too. And um, this tells me something. This tells me that that kid is interested in politics. He may not realize that. He may not go, oh yes, indeed I am. Indeed I'm part of three campaign group. No, not necessarily. He may be taking no obvious political action at all. But if he names Winston Churchill as someone he really admires, he's interested in politics. If he named Nelson Mandela, or Barack Obama, or Mahatma Gandhi, he's interested in politics. He's interested in how communities organize themselves and are led for a better world. That is a political issue in the best sense of the word. So you learn a lot what your uh, you learn a lot about your children by who they admire. Yeah? And where their sense of purpose is by who they admire. And bad mentors and bad figures to admire cause real problems. If the kid says, the person I really admire is the dealer, drug dealer at the end of my street who's got more guns than anyone else and has killed more people than anyone else in the history of our neighborhood, this is not a very good mentor to have. <laughs> yeah? And yet, what they're saying is, underneath it, I admire strength and achievement, but it's coming out in a really inappropriate and unhealthy way. This is a bad mentor. When I was a kid, I loved hip hop music, and my sons, it's very big in UK culture, my sons love it. But many of the hip hop artists I listen, they listen to, I have huge objections to. I find them hugely misogynistic, hugely aggressive, very negative messages, messages largely based in hate, and yet they're brilliantly articulate, some of them. But me and my kids keep arguing about whether this is good social interaction or not. They're like, you should listen to hip hop music. And I say, yeah, but my, for instance, my hip hop artist heroes did not call women bitches. Your one does. I don't think that's an appropriate way to speak about a woman. And they're like, oh, this is a better way to speak about a woman. It's only music, Dad. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's more than that. And I don't think you should speak about women like that. And they look at me like I'm 99. <laughs> but I, we, it's an, an ongoing argument we have. Yeah? Because I don't like some of the messages that their mentors are giving them and, the, and what, that, what that means. For instance, to say hello to someone by going, a gun gesture, bang bang as a gesture, come on. So who our kids are influenced by and who they admire is a major issue, a major issue. And we need students to have good mentors people who they look up to, who embody something positive in the world. Um, and what do they love doing? 
one of the things, the activities that they enjoy most or spend most time on. I have my two boys, one absolutely loves football, the other absolutely loves PlayStation. Now I learned two key things about this. My younger son is highly competitive. Anyone who enjoys sports tends to be pretty competitive. He also likes physical movement. He's also quite tribal. He has his team and he likes his colors and he's into all of that. These could all become great leadership skills if he can put them into the right place in the long run. He's a little little, but right now I don't mind him just liking it for the reason of liking it. His older brother, who loves PlayStation so much, also loves taking the machines apart. This is very promising for me. It means engineering, design, technology. And indeed, recently, I was taken on a, store, a tour of a school in Hong Kong, and we walked into a room which had had a sponsorship deal with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and there was a 3D printer in front of us. And I immediately thought, God, Finn would love that. This is a sign of what our children are. 3D printer, for him, is like so cool. I can make so many things out of that. His brother would be like, that's so boring. But out the window, I see a football pitch. This is the fire alarm for our students. And it can come in many different ways. So a kid who, for instance, loves acting, like I did as a kid, he's not necessarily just going to be an actor. That's an enormously important skill for teaching. Sorry, but true. It is also an enormously important skill for politics. You think that the really good politicians are not good actors? And I include people like that, the great ethical integrity folks like, you know, Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela. These guys had really good performance skills. They would never have got where they did without them. Um, and also, it's very important for things like uh, communication, public speaking, all of that. It's not just acting. It's also an emotional intelligence skill, sometimes. Um, if, a, if a kid really loves design and technology, that can be medicine, engineering, architecture, designing games. There's millions of ways that these talents emerge in the world. But noticing what they are is a key thing. Now, uh, I'm going to finish with something around this month. Uh, this is a quote by an American writer called Marion Williamson. It's pretty good. It's so good that Nelson Mandela, quite deliberately, he didn't hide this, stole it and put it in the middle of his inauguration speech when he became president of South Africa. And if Mandela, with all that he had read and experienced, chose this to put at the heart of his inauguration message, I think it's pretty useful for the rest of us. But it's written by the American writer Marion Williamson. This, I told students this this morning, and will be tomorrow morning, and Thursday and Friday. This is just about the best leadership quote I think I've ever heard. Um, she writes this, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be successful, talented, or fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your plan small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others will not feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. It is not just in some people. It is in everyone. Now, before I turn to the end of the quote, Sometimes we hear things like this and think, oh, politicians always say stuff like this in inaugurations. And then it never really works out that way. So, let's just review this for a second. When my son, Finn, my other son was born, he was born very premature. And um, he was born by cesarean. And his mum and I helped him in the post-op. And then she went back to her ward because she'd just been through a pretty major surgery. And I went with him to get him weighed. And I stood in the elevator with the nurse and he was in a little kind of like trolley thing with a blanket. And he was making a really weird noise. And I leaned down and I heard him go, 
And I said to the nurse, is that okay? And she went over and went, no, and pressed a different button on the elevator. And the doors of the elevator opened, and the sign said, intensive care. And it was like the elevator had just collapsed. It was like my whole world fell apart. And I remember thinking, my God, I had no idea I had so many control mechanisms in me that I wasn't conscious of, because I now feel completely out of control. And they, uh, she grabbed his trolley and walked very fast down the hall and said to one of the nurses, breathing difficulties, breathing difficulties. That she then went through a door and there was a room full of really sick children in incubators with heart monitors with the whole the beeping sounds and everything and i felt absolutely terrified not frightened terrified and he was put in a, a corner he was put where there was a space and a whole medical team was then around him and he was given an oxygen mask and a cathode and a hydrating so they so he could be hydrated and a heart monitor was put on him and I started hearing his heartbeat and everything. And, I, and the doctor was trying to talk to me and I was hardly listening. The doctor was actually saying this can happen, it's not necessarily life threatening but we have to take every precaution. But I was looking at him and he was about that big. And I remember thinking, what if something happens to you? What am I going to go downstairs and tell your mum? We have been looking forward to this day for so long and it's turning into a complete nightmare. And then I remember looking at him and thinking, what if you died? And then I realized something, which I have tried never to forget. And what I realized is the most powerful thing I had ever experienced was that big and standing right, sitting right in front of me. And then I remember looking at all the other children on the ward and thinking, they are unbelievably powerful in terms of what they are doing, they can do to us as parents. And yet they can't even speak yet. Now Finn is now 13. He has long blonde hair, he looks quite Brazilian, which he loves to be told because he loves the idea that he might be quite Brazilian. And um, he is very alive, but back then he was very sick and he was grabbing at the mask to try and breathe. And what he wanted was his mum. And he was too ill and she was downstairs and she didn't know what was happening yet. This for me was the most profound moment of my life. In fact, virtually everything I try and do in my work is really based around that moment. Because it was at that moment that I realized that Marion Williamson was right. We were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. It is not just in some people. It is in everyone. Now she ended with this, and this is the best thing she quote I have ever heard. She said, as we let our own light shine, surely a key purpose of education, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence in the world can begin to liberate others. That needs to be a part of every child's curriculum. Thank you for coming along. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you all for coming out this evening.
appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there are still probably some refreshments out there, so uh, please do help yourselves, and I'm sure Beth would be happy to. Yeah, yes, to have to talk um, with anybody wants to come up and say hello. Thank you.